So welcome everyone. It's our lecture number 12. Uh, we are going to discuss about fabrics, which means foliations and lineations in the rocks. So what we will do, we'll uh, first look a bit at the terminology. As usual, when we start something new, we discuss a bit the terminology, and then we'll look at foliations and at lineations. Uh, important aspects, um, they reflect a, a preferential orientation of uh, minerals in the rocks as a result of the formation. So let's see what you are talking here. So uh, as I just said, terminology first. So in general, fabric, it's a word that refers when, when you want to discuss about the geometric arrangement of various um, features. Um, this could be in general uh, minerals, uh, mineral grains in a rock. Um, so that you should see these features uh, on such a scale that you can see many, many examples, many samples of each feature, yeah? And then you can discuss about the fabric. And here I said that we discuss about foliation, which you can see. So here the, we talk about um, uh, orientations of elements that are uh, planar, yeah? So they, they are planar. Uh, and for instance, here we can talk about cleavage, uh, schistosity, nisosity, bedding as well, bedding. Um, but the idea is if it's primary or secondary. So that's why I haven't mentioned here uh, bedding. You see cleavage, schistosity, nisosity, because they are fabric elements, which are called secondary uh, as a result of the formation. And um, bedding is a primary uh, fabric element. So we have um, an evolution here. So when we talk about cleavage, we talk about rocks that start being transformed under uh, conditions of low temperature. Um, then when you increase the metamorphic grade, that means intermediate temperatures, um, and also you have um, original stress, we have rocks that have schistosity and uh, schists. Um, and the schistosity is basically defined by uh, mica minerals, like muscovite or biotite. And then when the, the metamorphic rate increases more, we'll discuss about gnisosity. Yeah, so this is a typical uh, fabric that you see in gnisis. Uh, it's a type of foliation. Uh, but uh, here the rock was transformed to at higher temperatures. So here you, you also have um, a separation of the minerals in uh, felsic and mafic minerals. And we call that compositional bending or gnisic bending. So as you can see, by discussing fabrics, we discuss a bit about metamorphic petrology. That's why um, geology is such a complex field. You cannot just separate one aspect and discuss it uh, in a void without having to make reference to other domains of uh, the geological sciences. Now, lineations here means that we have elements that are linear, yeah? And you'll see what elements can be linear in a rock and uh, that give a lineation um, to the rock. So let's have a look. Uh, first, with some images. This is the one, uh, the one from the textbook, but I think it's a very good one, yeah? Because here uh, we have some rocks that are called uh, slates uh, here, and that's why this is called slaty cleavage. Uh, basically, uh, they are rocks just uh, that suffered uh, low temperature metamorphism, yeah? And this leads to the formation of cleavage. And you can see here, these are sandy layers, so uh, basically sandstones. And you can see the cleavage being vertical, yeah? Uh, as, it, uh, as the rock splits along vertical planes, yeah? You see the split, uh, the splitting that happens. And here we have a shale 
um, a shell uh, layer. And here the cleavage, you see it's left dipping and you, you see the cleavage. So you can imagine these planes um, at an angle being oriented in the rock. So this would be cleavage, yeah? So for a rock that suffered low grade metamorphism. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, when we talk about gneisses, yeah? So a rock that suffered uh, significant metamorphism and uh, became a gneiss. Here, what you can see, you, you see what is called compositional bending or gneissic bending. So you see this separation into um, zones of felsic minerals, the white ones, and uh, zones of uh, darker minerals, mafic minerals, the uh, dark ones. These are not sedimentary layers. Yeah, this is a metamorphic rock. And this planar orientation, yeah, this bending, yeah, it's a type of, um, of a foliation. That's the idea. So we will be looking at these aspects here. So, as I just said, fabric, we describe this orientation of certain elements in a rock. And here, what, what uh, you can see in the text here, it says fabric is used to describe penetrative and distributive components of rock masses. So what this means, penetrative means that it goes, so this um, feature, exists in the volume of rock, yeah? It is penetrative and distributive. It's distributed uh, in the volume of rock. So um, you can see here something that uh, shows lineations, and these are also called L-tectonites, and something that shows foliations, yeah, planar fabrics called S-tectonites. So here is an example of a mica schist, yeah? So mica schist has basically mica minerals, can be muscovite, for instance, that is preferentially, these crystals of muscovite are preferentially oriented along a certain direction. And this gives uh, this shine, yeah, this shine to the, to, to the schist, yeah. And it gives the schistosity. So basically this is an S tectonite, yeah. This is an, an S-tectonite. Teacher, sorry, I have a question. Yes, yes Gabriel. So when we talk about um, cleavage, it's the same concept in mineralogy that in here in, 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 in large scale? Are they related each other? Or? So I, I am not sure I understand what's the relationship with mineralogy. Cleavage. Cleavage, for example, when we talk uh, oh, the about cleavage in, uh, in mineralogy. Um, well, no, actually, that, that's a property of minerals. Yeah, that's a property of minerals that they have cleavage. So the crystals, actually, they have planes of weakness. Yeah, they have planes of weakness. And uh, when we describe about uh, describe the minerals we can say it has good cleavage poor cleavage and so on which are basically the result of uh, the crystal structure when we talk about cleavage in the rocks so not in the actual minerals cleavage in the rocks at the scale of you know we talk about cleavage in structure geology we do not refer to the cleavage of minerals we refer to the fact that the rock is transformed in such a form that it acquires a foliation. And this foliation, when it, we talk about cleavage, it, it has the tendency to split, to split along certain planes uh, with a preferential orientation. But, but these planes are related to the reorientation of the actual minerals in the rock as a result of metamorphism. So, the reorientation, for, for instance, through plastic, uh, for instance, plastic deformation can lead to reorientation of, of uh, the minerals so that they take a preferential orientation. It doesn't have to do with the actual planes of cleavage within the minerals. So uh, maybe uh, some of you uh, didn't uh, study yet petrology or all of you. Um, 
and you study just mineralogy. But we cannot do geology without talking about rocks. So the idea is that you have to bear in mind that the rocks are aggregates of minerals. So we are at the larger scale of complexity. Yeah? So you learned about the building blocks of rocks, but now we talk about things that happen in the rocks. Yeah. So I, I hope, Gabriel, that uh, it's now clear that we talk about different things that you know uh, may use the same word like mineral cleavage. But here we talk about cleavage in a rock, so not in a not in a crystal. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, teacher. It's clear okay. now for me. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good. No, I think it was a good question. I mean, uh, thanks for asking it, Gabriel, because uh, I haven't thought of it. Yeah. Because in in my mind, I I didn't think about the mineral cleavage being something different. But I think that it's good you asked it since it came to your mind, because in the same manner, it, it, it could cross the mind of any of your colleagues and they don't want you to be confused. Yeah. So that's the idea. All right. So uh, I think that uh, this ties very nicely with the fact that we were looking at this schist. And as I was saying, here we, we look at the orientation of the mica crystals, for instance, barotite, yeah, or muscovite, whatever it has. I think this has uh, muscovite, but I cannot see it very well because it's almost like black and white, yeah, here, so, and those shades here. Uh, might have both uh, muscovite and biotite, this schist. So the idea, the idea is that this, uh, mica crystals have a preferential orientation as a result of metamorphosis. So the the initial rock was different, but it gets transformed so severely that you have the reorientation or the formation of new minerals uh, and grow of new minerals. And because you have the stress oriented uh, differential, you have differential stress, the minerals grow in such a way that they acquire a preferential orientation. Yeah, that's the idea. So, um, so this is what's also called an S tectonite. Yeah, this uh, rock that has a foliation, a rock that has a lineation is called an L tectonite. Now you'll see rocks that have both foliation and lineation, and then they are called SL <laughs> um, tectonites. So here is an example of. Uh, something that can uh, have a lineation. This, this is an actinolite schist. Um, now, the lineation here, the actinolite, basically these are uh, elongated crystals of actinolite is an amphibole. It's in a series with the end member being a tremolite and actinolite, yeah? Depending if one member has more magnesium and one more iron, yeah? Tremolite, actinolite. These are um, amphiboles, and the green ones, they are, uh, some are bigger here, you can see, they are elongated crystals. And if you look in this part of the rock, they have a certain preferential orientation, so it, it imparts a lineation to the rock. Now, if I look carefully at this rock, um, it might have also a foliation that, that uh, gives you the, the idea of some planes, yeah? so it might have some uh, I don't see it very well, but it might have some um, uh, fine crystals of mica as well. And then this would be an LS tectonite, but I am not sure because I cannot see it better than what I see here. So it's just as an example of what type of minerals, yeah, the elongated ones, can give a lineation uh, to a rock. Now, so here, I think things will become clear. You can have a rock, which where the minerals have no preferred orientation. For instance, uh, uh, you know, the rocks that are, um, that are igneous, which means they cooled from a magma. Uh, in most cases, they there is no uh, preferred orientation of the, uh, of the crystals inside. So it's a random fabric. If you see a certain pattern that, as you can see here, you can see foliation, you see lineation. So you have minerals that are uh, kind of planar, platy minerals oriented in a certain direction, or uh, uh, elongated minerals like actinolite orient, uh, oriented in a, a certain direction. Then you talk about a preferred fabric, yeah? And that's why preferred fabric is a clear indication of deformed rocks, yeah, of 
rocks that suffered deformation. During the deformation, they you know, these fabrics uh, were formed during the deformation and also the transformation of the rock during metamorphism. So, so that's why I'm saying that here we are overlapping our discussion with aspects of petrology. But if we, we focus on the structural aspects of the rocks, yeah, that's the idea. Whereas in petrology, when you will take the class with Marcos, you will discuss about the pressure temperature conditions to that lead to transformations and how the, uh, the mineral species transform from one into another with the change of the uh, ambient of the pressure and temperature. Yeah, that's the, the idea. So as I just mentioned, yeah, we have planar fabric foliations, you see them, and linear fabrics lineations, you see here. Um, so another aspect, yeah, uh, when we talk about continuous fabric, continuous fabric, yeah. So the idea is at what scale of observation and you can break the rock and look at it and you still see the fabric and break it more, uh, a smaller piece and you can still see the fabric. So I think this, this diagram kind of conveys the idea, yeah? So you, you, when you look, you, you, you can see this. So that's the idea that there is no strict limit, but more or less like if the fabric um, elements that these uh, crystals are closer yeah, than one millimeter, and then they impart this fabric. So we talk about the continuous fabric. But in other rocks, the, the spacing between these minerals can be larger, yeah? So then we talk about the spaced fabric. Now, this is just to, to be clear, uh, you won't find very often, you know, the discussion, is it a continuous or a spaced fabric and so on? The discussion is more focused on whether it's a foliation, it's a lineation and so on. Now, I just mentioned, just to, you know, have it here for the record, yeah? Uh, L-technonite means linear, yeah? Linear like here. Uh, S-tectonite means planar, like here, yeah? And L-S, it contains both. Okay, now let's talk about foliations. Let's talk about foliations. And when I talk about foliation as a general term, yeah? Uh, we talk about structures that are more or less planar. Yeah. Now the plane may not might not be a very perfect mathematical plane. It may curve a bit. Yeah. Um, but we talk about this in a metamorphic rock. Yeah. Uh, so in general, we talk about foliation in metamorphic rocks. But but uh, there could be primary foliations. So. Uh, preferred of orientation of certain elements, yeah, uh, and primary, that means associated with the formation of the rock, yeah, the processes of, uh, of formation. So imagine in the sedimentary rocks, you have bedding, yeah, you have bedding. So this, you can call it a foliation. There is a, a certain um, planar element, which is the interface between the different beds, but it's a primary fabric, yeah, so people will not call them, you know, foliation, really. I mean, of course, if we want to be very precise, we can say primary foliations, but people will say bedding. Yeah. Um, in the magmatic rocks, the, the rocks formed from the crystallization of a magma, yeah, um, you can have magmatic layering, which means you'd see layers of different com chemical composition and mineralogical composition. So, the idea is that you can see these magmatic layers in certain cases, and that would be uh, called the primary foliation. Now, in general, when we talk about metamorphic rocks, we, we, we uh, say foliation, but this foliation is uh, officially secondary foliation because it's formed in a rock that was transformed, yeah, as a result of uh, deformation. So, secondary foliations, yeah. These are tectonic foliations, yeah, tectonic foliations. Uh, most of them are in response to tectonic stress. And here is an example, axial plane cleavage. I, I, I'm gonna show you what axial plane cleavage is, but as an example. So we are gonna focus our discussion now on tectonic foliations, yeah? 
So we are not going to discuss about bedding, about layering in igneous rocks and so on. We are going to discuss about tectonic foliations and uh, as a result of the formation um, uh, uh, related to tectonic stress. And here we talk about cleavages. So cleavages in the rocks, schistosity, gneissic bending. You also have myelonitic foliations, yeah? But anyway, we'll, we'll look at the cleavage, histoicity, and gneissic bending in a bit more detail. Now, here, I think it's a good example. That's why I, I, I wanted to have a, a few comments on it. So what says here? Let's, let's look at the uh, caption here. It says, two generations of foliations in Metagabro uh, in a Caledonian of Fiolite fragment. I'm going to uh, do a bit of translation for you because one one sentence you have a lot of geological meaning here and my point here is i want you to introduce now more to the field of geology yeah, as a complex field not only talk about one thing yeah so let's let's look here let's start about this the rock the rock is called meta gabbro now the gabbro the gabbro is a um, mafic rock yeah so uh, and the, in terms of mineralogy, because I, I know that you didn't study petrology, in terms of mineralogy, it is equivalent to the rock called basalt. But the difference between basalt and gabbro. Mary Ellen? All right. Uh, I was hearing some music. And uh, so the difference between uh, basalt and gabbro is that the the basalt is formed from the crystallization of a lava and lava is magma that got to the surface to the surface of the earth and because it gets to the surface it cools very fast because it cools very fast the mineral crystals do not have time to grow big so all the crystals will be very small and we cannot see them with the naked eye we need a microscope and then the rock has a texture called aphanitic. No problem, Maria. That's fine. Don't worry. Um, so I'm giving you a, a few elements of pet petrology because I think it is important that you understand these rocks. So, so basalt is a very important rock. So you cannot see the crystals with, the, with, with your eye. The gabbro has the same minerals like the basalt. It will it will have basically uh mostly plagioclase yeah uh feldspar plagioclase uh with a bit of quartz yeah but a bit not much um and some mafic of course mafic minerals like uh amphiboles for instance so what happens is uh the gabbro is formed from magma at depth and because it's formed from magma at depth the crystals have time to grow and you can see them. So you can see, oh, yeah, say this is a plagioclase crystal and this is a, now is a hornblende and so on. So that's the, the thing. So gabbro, now you know what gabbro is. Mafic because uh, it has mafic minerals in it, in addition to uh, feldspar plagioclase. Now, meta gabbro, the, uh, the prefix meta is put in front of the name of a rock if it suffered metamorphism. Yeah, so this what we are looking at is a metamorphic, a metamorphosed gabbro. Yeah, it suffered metamorphosis. So what happened here is this gabbro, as you can see, it had initial a primary foliation, which was magmatic layering, like here. So you can see layers of different of different mineralogic composition, more mafic and more felsic layers. Yeah, the more felsic layers have more plagioclase, the more mafic layers, the darker ones, have more mafic minerals like hornblende. Now, this rock initially had this magmatic layering, but it was metamorphosed. So, so under tectonic stress, it, it acquired a new fabric. And it's this one, yeah? It is what it says, a shear-related 
foliation. So because it, this part of the gabbro uh, was entrained in a shear zone, yeah, there was plastic deformation, a reorientation of the crystals, yeah, and it acquired this foliation here, which you see marked as S1. So a geologist, and you might be in the future, might be working with a company or with a, a Servicio Geologico, you go to map. And when you map, you have to look at the, at the different generations of fabric in a rock. So you have to say, well, we have two generations here. One, it's the primary, and this is a secondary. And then some rocks that have a very complicated uh, tectonic history have several generations of deformation. You have to be able to identify them, yeah? So that's the idea. That's why I think this is a very good example, yeah? Caledonian means during the Caledonian orogeny in the Paleozoic, uh, Ophiolite fragment means a fragment of oceanic crust that was emplaced on the continental crust when an ocean was closed. So they, uh, and, and an or orogenic belt basically marks the closure of an ocean. And we will talk about these things in the second part of the course, which is gonna be very interesting. Huh? So that's why I wanted you to, to, to uh, look at only at this little picture and now you know a lot more, you can see a lot more in it. Yeah, that's the idea. Okay, now cleavage, yeah, cleavage in rocks. <laughs> um, so when we talk about cleavage in rocks, we talk about the, uh, uh, the rock uh, acquires these planes along which it can split or cleave. Yeah, but it, we talk about the rock, the whole rock, not a mineral as Gabriel was pointing out. We use the same word, but we don't talk about the crystals. We talk about the rock, yeah. And um, the idea is that um, this type of foliation that we call cleavage is, uh, occurs in what, what's called very low grade uh, metamorphic rocks. So that means rocks that suffer the bit of metamorphism, but not too much. Yeah, so um, the, the level of metamorphism is called, for instance, lower green schist facies. I know you haven't studied yet the met metamorphic petrology, so I don't expect you to know these things, but I'm giving you, because the more you hear these things, the easier it will be. You'll remember when you'll study with Marcos, if you'll remember, you'll say, oh yeah, sure, I know about this, yeah. All right. So you see here some uh, text from uh, from textbook, low temperature version of foliation, yeah? And of course you might, might, must have rocks that have minerals that are uh, planar, like micas, so that they can orient themselves and create this, um, this foliation. And you see the, the mechanism, yeah? Grain rotation, and the growth of minerals with a preferred uh, direction. Um, and for instance, you can have pressure solution. You remember we discussed about pressure solution, yeah? Now, this is a very spe uh, special case of cleavage that you can see it's called pencil cleavage because you can, uh, you can get um, not kind of sheets of rock, but things that are kind of, uh, you know, like pencils, you see them, but that's because platy means uh, flat, yeah? A mineral that is flat, like the mica, yeah? That's platy, uh, a planar mineral. So the, here you have intersection of uh, different foliation planes that make the rock split and get this, this, uh, so-called pencil cleavage, yeah? So you have different planes of cleavage that uh, split the rock. But the most common uh, way cleavage looks like is this, yeah? So you see, you, you see it here. So, um, the, uh, and the rocks that typically have this uh, cleavage are called slates, yeah? So they are slightly metamorphosed shales. Slightly metamorphosed shales will basically have the cleavage. And uh, you see, this is a query 
a query in the United States. And you see here uh, a, a person. This is a, a man here. <laughs> you see a uh, worker here. So you look at the at the scale, yeah, at the scale of these planes. Yeah, it's quite impressive, yeah, quite impressive. Of course, um, uh, it's not only in the United States. Uh, there are famous uh, localities for uh, uh, slates uh, that have cleavage, the splitting capacity in um, Belgium, for instance. And uh, in that region, many houses have their roofs, yeah, the techos, with uh, sheets of, um, of slates yeah, from these quarries, for instance. Now, uh, this is a specimen, yeah, uh, it says a specimen, and you can see the cleavage yeah, in, in the slate, yeah, uh, for instance. All right, um, let's see. Now, there is something I, I mentioned, axial plane cleavage. So, um, and here is a sentence that says uh, uh, in, in important things. It says, many cleavages, are ex axial planar, yeah, and thus represent an important link between tectonic foliation and folds. So the idea is, if you remember, we discussed about folds last time, for instance, and uh, the uh, the class uh, prior to um, to the uh, to the last one, and we discussed about the axial plane of folds, yeah, and it's very interesting that the cleavage forms parallel. Yeah, parallel to the axial surface of a fold. Yeah, so th the idea is that you can see the cleavage, the cleavage planes here, which are parallel. Yeah, to the axial to the axial plane of the fold here. So this is axial plane cleavage. So it's a very interesting link. Yeah, you can now uh, make uh, make some connections. Of course. The deformation actually has many facets. It deforms things geometrically, but it also creates this fabric in the rock. Yeah. So you can see the fold is a result of deformation. The cleavage, which is a type of foliation, is also a result of deformation. Yeah. So that's the idea. Axial plane cleavage, you'll, you'll, you'll encounter this um, uh, a lot in the literature. So if you if you read here, it says discrete cleavage in uh, phylite. Now, phylite is slightly more metamorphosed than the slate, yeah, but not not too much. So the idea is that this initial sedimentary layer, the the slate layer, was folded, yeah, but also it suffered this internal deformation yeah in the rock that reoriented the mica uh, minerals so that you have planes of cleavage that's the idea now here is something i, I would say this is quite spectacular uh, so it says an overturned sink line now they don't say seam form like if i would just see this thing i would say well it's an overturned seam form because i don't know the stratigraphy but presumably, presumably, the authors uh, know the stratigraphy here. Yeah, so we can say, well, this is a sink line. But it, you see, it is turned on its side, so an overturned sink line. Yeah, and here, if I were to ask you, where is the axial plane? Well, you'll say, well, the axial plane is here. Yeah, this is more or less the axial uh, plane or surface. And if you look carefully, you'll see that the the axial uh, plane cleavage, you'll see it everywhere. Yeah, so parallel to to the axial plane. Yeah, very nice, very nice picture. All right. Now, uh, I told you that that rock when Peter, I was showing you. Yes. So. Um, yes, Gabriel. A unit of 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 rock planar um, una capa, una unidad de capa. Uh, this um, uh, is it possible that it could present a, a foliation transversal to the to the uh, to the 
a la capa, o sea, lo, es posible que los planos de, de, de clivaje de las capas sean transversales a la capa como tal? Mm, I'm not sure, like perpendicular to the, uh, to the yeah. uh, well. Um, acá, yo veo, por ejemplo, en esta foto que eh, acá están unos planos yes. que parecen clivaje, yes. pero son transversales a las, a las capas. Yes, but uh, transversales, you mean per, uh, more or less like a, yes. a, at a high angle to the capas. Sí. That's what they are. But they are formed during the deformation. Initially, the rock, when it was horizontal and nice, didn't have this feature. Yeah. Okay. So when this was deformed, this was not only folded, but it also acquired a penetrative deformation. Yeah, because this is what these foliations are. Penetrative means it's in the volume of rock. So what what it means? It, it means that you didn't have just the conditions to mechanically bend bend the uh, the layer, but also you had some pressure and temperature. Uh, the pressure, of course, was there, the differential stress, but you had some temperature also that caused changes in the volume of the rock so that it acquired this preferential orientation of certain minerals. Yeah, so that's what happened. So when we, uh, what we are doing now, Gabriel, we are increasing a bit the level of complexity. Yeah, we talked about folding. Okay, we understand folding, but now more things happen in the rock. Yeah, because you don't have just the stress, you have also the temperature and the rock starts getting transformed. Yeah, that's the idea. And that's why uh, because of this stress, yeah, because of this stress, imagine, like, like in this figure, yeah? Imagine you have the, uh, the layer that gets folded, yeah? So you have the, basically the differential stress, the maximum principal stress like this. Also, the minerals in the rock will rotate or recrystallize or, you know, suffer, um, uh, suffer a wet diffusion, yeah, pressure solution. So the platy minerals will reorient in a preferential direction, and guess what? The the uh, the uh, planar part of these minerals will be perpendicular to the maximum stress, and that's why that's why this cleavage this cleavage is basically parallel to the axial plane. Yeah, this is a reason because they are all responses to the orientation of the stress yeah situation. That's the idea. I don't think you did sure. Okay. Okay. All right. So now uh, I mentioned uh, the um, phylite. So you talked about slate. Imagine the slate is a shale, slightly, slightly metamorphosed. Now, uh, when you have higher temperature, you have the pressure, you have higher temperature, yeah, and you have the stress you form new phyllosilicate minerals. So let's see what this says. Again, I have to, to give you a bit of petrology so that you understand what happens. So it says new phyllosilicate minerals. Phyllosilicate are like micas, yeah, micas. So uh, it could be uh, muscovite, uh, yeah, for instance, this is uh, biotite, but in general, muscovite, yeah. New phyllosilicate minerals grow at the expense of clay minerals uh, in shales and slates. Yeah, when they enter the field of green schist, facies, metamorphist. So what happens? What happens is you increase the temperature. Yeah, so you have uh, imagine that a rock gets buried. Yeah, so from a shale, first it, it becomes a slate. And then this is sub green schist facies metamorphism. So conditions uh, kind of at the beginning of metamorphism. And then you increase this uh, pressure and temperature conditions. So the, the metamorphism is more intense. That means that the clay minerals that have water in them, because of the higher temperature, they lose 
yeah, they lose the water. And then a new mineral is formed. And the new mineral is a phyllosilicate. It's a mica, basically. It can be a very fine-grained mica or muscovite. Yeah? So what happens is you have now not only recrystallization of the same minerals or deformation or rotation. Now you have transformation of minerals from one species into another. Yeah. And because these phyllosilicate minerals are formed, yeah, you form uh, the rock is no longer a shale, is no longer a slate, it's a phyllite. And that's what a phyllite looks looks like, yeah. So it has this very nice sheen. Yeah, this the you you can see how it shines, yeah, because all these micas are oriented in the same direction. So uh, when you move it in light, there will be an angle where they all send the light to you. They are, reflect the light to your eyes. So this is the fine light, but it's very fine grained phyllosilicate minerals. And the cleavage that you see here, it's called phyllitic cleavage. Now the phyllitic uh, cleavage is not as good a cleavage as the one in slates, yeah? So it will not split that easily, yeah? So now the, the foliation will not lead to separation from, from now on, yeah? That's very typical for, for slates, but it still shows you these planes of preferential orientation in the rock, yeah? So that's uh, how we evolve from cleavage to phyllitic cleavage, and now we'll go to schistosity. So we increase the metamorphic conditions. We increase the temperature here, yeah? And we get schistosity. So we moved from below the green schist facies into the green schist facies. And then now we go at the upper uh, part of the conditions of the green schist facies and, or, and maybe into the lower amphibolite facies. So what happens is you have larger mica grains, yeah? So compare this to this. So here the mica is basically so fine, you, you see the result that all of them are aligned in the same plane and you see them shining, but you cannot see the individual crystal, yeah, with your naked eye. But here the crystals grow larger, so you see them, yeah? Now, what happens, you also have large uh, grains of quartz and feldspar, yeah, or aggregates of quartz and feldspar. So this, this mica uh, minerals, they have to go around these uh, quartz and feldspar grains, which are also larger. So they have to kind of go around. So the planes are no longer so nice planes. They are kind of curvilinear uh, surfaces. So, uh, you know, the, the foliation is there, the uh, preferential orientation, but it's kind of coarser, yeah, coarser. So you can, you can see here what I mean, like you can see the preferential orientation, you can see it here, but you know, it has to go around, around the quartz and feldspar, yeah, aggregates. So that's why in a slate, very nice plane, you, you've seen it, yeah, it's like in mathematics, you can attach a, a, the formula of a plane to it. Now here, we are talking about a more complex surface, not really a plane, but it, it's still, the preferential orientation exists, yeah? So you, you can see it, yeah? So this type of foliation is called schistosity, and the rocks that have schistosity are called schists, yeah? So you, you learned about schists probably in the, the general uh, geology um, course, yeah? So here, look at the, at the microscopic, uh, Mechanism. So it says that the wet diffusion, yeah, wet diffusion governs cleavage formation. Because you remember when we discussed about the microscopic processes of plastic deformation, we had a little map showing in terms of, pre, of uh, differential stress and temperature what mechanism dominates. Yeah. And you remember the pressure solution uh, did not require large temperatures. But as you increase the temperature, yeah, as you increase the temperature, we have 
plastic, yeah, crystal plastic deformation mechanisms. Yeah. So that's the idea. Uh, now you can see that why do we discuss then, and we are you maybe you are thinking, well, why are we discussing all these things? You are not gonna see them anyway. Well, we see the effects, yeah. And now we understand the rocks better. You can see that as we advance in this course, it starts to take yeah a geological dimension. Now we can talk about things in the rocks. We we don't just talk about the dry things like stress and strain and things like this and some mathematics there. We now we start looking at the rocks. That's the idea. All right. So um, you can see, for instance, schistosity in quartz-rich rocks. Of course, it will be coarse, a, a coarser schistosity, yeah, and in sheer granites and so on. If you increase, yeah. Uh, the uh, metamorphic conditions more, yeah. So the rock will no longer be a schist, will, will become a gneiss, yeah. So the gneiss is more intense metamorphism, yeah. So in the gneiss, it's very typical to see this type of foliation, which is called compositional or gneissic bending, yeah. Like these bands, yeah, uh, of uh, preferentially mafic and more felsic uh, minerals. But they are not sedimentary layers, not at all. Don't just think that, yeah? This is a rock that was formed at depth and it has nothing to do with sedimentary rocks, with the initial sedimentary rocks. It has to do with processes of deformation that were the earlier structures yeah, in the rock were flattened and they rotated and they became parallel. And of course, there is plastic uh, at, at the microscopic scale, you have a recrystallization and plastic deformation. And the whole process that leads to the formation of this is called transposition. Yeah? And this type of foliation is also called transposition foliation. Yeah? In a very simplistic way, it's shown, uh, you, can, you, you can get the idea. But also, I want to clarify one petrological aspect. When you look at the gneiss, you may wonder what the initial rock was. The initial rock that was transformed into a gneiss. So the question is, it could have been a sedimentary rock. Yeah, it could have been a sandstone. Yeah, with shales. A re, a, a, uh, but it could have been a granite as well, like an igneous rock, yeah? And you can get gneiss. The gneisses that are formed from uh, sedimentary rocks are called paragneisses. And the ones that are formed from the igneous rocks are called orthognisis. Um, and the idea is very often you may not be able to do it with the naked eye. Yeah, the, the gneiss will look similar to, and you won't be able necessarily to say, well, this comes from a sedimentary rock or from an igneous rock. But the uh, mineralogical composition and the chemistry tells you a lot about these things, yeah, for instance. So um, the idea is when you look at such a rock, you would call it a gneiss, unless you have other sources of information to tell you if it's a paragnize or an orthognize. Yeah, that's the idea. All right. So um, in this case, by the way it looks to my eyes, but I've seen many types of gnices, yeah? Uh, I would have said that it is an orthognize. And it, indeed, it says here, it's formed during shearing of a heterogeneous intrusive complex. So intrusive complex is a, an intrusion that has different regions of different uh, different types of rocks, yeah? That's a complex. All right. So now you can see these things. And now um, another example of a bandit, bandit gneiss, yeah? Uh, and you can see this. All right, so to summarize, to summarize, we learned not only about foliation so far, we learned a bit about metamorphic petrology. So when you will have the course with Marcos, you will know some things and he will be impressed that you know them, yeah? So you see 
what we can have such this type of metamorphism, starting with a shale, yeah, and with increasing metamorphism, the rock is transformed into a slate of phyllite, a schist, and the gneiss. We are not looking at the met, uh, metamorphic process here to discuss. We are looking at the formation of foliations with metamorphism. And that's how we learned about uh, cleavage, philitic cleavage, schistosity, and gneissic or compositional banding. Yeah, so that was the idea. All right. So, so far, this is it with foliations. Now, you'll see when you'll see foliations in the rock and they are easy to see yeah you'll have an idea how they form yeah what they relate to now lineations lineations um, here is a complex situation it says lineations on foliation surfaces yeah so you can see that there are certain elements that impart yeah a, a kind of a linear uh, aspect to the rock now the rock is an LS tectonite, yeah, because it has also foliation, yeah. So this is our transition from foliations to lineations. So, like in the case of lineations, you can have primary, primary linear structures, yeah. So you see, generally speaking, a lineation is a fabric element, yeah, where you have one dimension larger than the other two. However, when we talk about the primary, not tectonic lineations, primary uh, linear structures, yeah. uh, look at this. You can have lava, and this is called the ropey lava. Yeah, so you can have linear, linear um, uh, structures uh, in the rock. But it, this just reflects the flow of the lava. Yeah, it reflects the flow of the lava and the fact that it froze during this flow. Yeah, and this ropey uh, lava, which you uh, find in Hawaii, very typical for Hawaii. Now, this one, uh, if you look at this, uh, uh, this is an igneous rock. Yeah, it is an igneous rock. But again, you can see a fabric in it, and it's a linear fabric. Yeah, you can see it here. So it is a primary lineation formed uh, in in this. Um, in this igneous rock, yeah. So let's see if I if we can uh, learn more about this. They don't say exactly what the uh, what type of rock it is, but it says the lineation formed in stiff magma ascending through a pipe, yeah, towards the surface. So you have here two opposite examples. I would say this one, yeah, it's not such a stiff magma because it is. Um, you know, in Hawaii, uh, you have less viscous magma yeah, that flows for uh, large distances and so on. Um, so this is one situation. Now, this is not at the surface. Now, this was eroded, what was, but this was in a pipe, yeah, so close, ascending towards the surface. And the flow of viscous magma imparted this flow uh, uh structure yeah which remained was preserved as a fabric in the uh igneous rock all right so this is primary okay which doesn't really interest us now in terms of of uh looking at deformation result what's the result of deformation so let's go to the tectonic yeah tectonic lineations so tectonic ones here what could give you know, uh, linear structures. Obviously, uh, as a result of the formation, you can have elongated physical objects. So let's say you have a conglomerate which has big pebbles in it, and the conglomerate is kind of deformed, yeah, squished, and the co the pebbles are elongated, are stretched, yeah. Imagine that one pebble like a like a, an initial sphere, let's say. And as it gets deformed, you get the, an ellipsoid, which reflects the ellipsoid of the formation. Yeah, this is real. I, I'm not kidding here. Um, so this is very typical. Now, you can have the lines of intersection between two sets of planar structures. So planar structures could be foliations, tectonic or primary, and 
where two planes intersect, yeah, they have uh, a linear uh, zone of intersection, yeah. Uh, theoretically, it's a line, yeah. So this imparts, yeah, in the volume of rock, you have multiple planes that intersect, and it imparts also a lineation. Yeah. Um, then imagine that you have uh, many folds, yeah, at, at a small scale, many folds, and they all have hinges, yeah, and that will give uh, a lineation, uh, for instance. So we can have different types of lineations. Some of them are penetrative in the same way like the foliation. So they are in the volume of rock, yeah. But others, and here I, you remember when we discussed about folds, we discussed about silicon lines, yeah. So the silicon lines, they are surface lineations. It's not a penetrative fabric. It's only on that surface there was the uh, slip of one block against the other and the formation of silicon lines, yeah. So these are surface lineations. Um, and the ones that where I was saying that you have intersections of different uh, of foliations, for instance, um, they are geometric lineations, yeah. So you can have penetrative, which reflects like the actinol actinolite um, crystals, yeah. They are elongated and they all get oriented due to due to the stress. They all get a preferred orientation. And that is a typical penetrative lineation. Yeah? If you have uh, a lineation as a result of intersection of different planes, that's a geometric lineation. Yeah, it's not the result of certain minerals. Yeah, being uh, oriented preferentially in a certain direction. But let's have a look here. Um, when we talk about mineral lineations, yeah, mineral lineations, they are penetrative. Yeah. Um, so you can see, you, you can have recrystallization, you can have um, dissolution precipitation, so that's uh, wet diffusion, uh, rotation, yeah, and this is penetrative, yeah, a penetrative fabric, uh, linear fabric. So um, as I just discussed, the actinolite, that's amphibole needles, yeah, uh, or you can have not necessarily actinolite, can be any amphibole uh crystals that have the oriented um prefer preferred orientation amphibolite is a metamorphic rock yeah it is above the green schist facies yeah uh, the amphibolite facies uh, that it would have this uh, lineation now here is what i was telling you about conglomerates yeah so you see stretching lineations so you see the pebbles they were basically stretched yeah you can see uh, these pebbles how they were stretched yeah as a result of uh, deformation so this is a stretching lineation yeah all right so um that's one possibility mineral lineations here uh, another example quartzite conglomerate yeah uh, again here we cannot see very well but these are very stretched very stretched pebbles yeah you uh it, it's hard to believe that you can take a, a pebble and stretch but this is what metamorphism does all right uh other examples here oh, 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 it's obvious that it's mineral lineations yeah uh this like the light colored minerals yeah uh silimonite yeah for instance um here feldspar crystals you see also the the white uh, colored crystals. So they are, they have a preferred direction. Now let's, uh, we'll, we'll finish soon, uh, three more slides or so. Uh, intersection lineations, intersection lineations. I was saying that you have to have two different uh, planar elements that intersect to, get, to give a lineation, yeah? And for instance, look at this hypothetical example you have sedimentary rocks you have sedimentary rocks and they are deformed as we discussed and they they form a fold you see the fold here and here yeah uh, let's say this is the stratigraphic normal stratigraphic section so here you have an anticline and the syncline what happens is 
you still have the bedding preserved. You can still see it called here S0, yeah? So this is the S fabric. It's a foliation, but it's a primary foliation, not a tectonic one. As we just discussed, as you fold this, there is also the formation of axial plane cleavage, axial plane cleavage. So you can see the axial plane cleavage being developed during the formation here. And this is the S1 fabric. Now, the intersection of these surfaces, yeah, S0, this is imagined above is another one. So the intersection of this surface of these cleavage planes will impart, will impart an intersection lineation into the rock, which is penetrative, yeah? So that's the idea. That's this example. When you read the papers that discuss this, the deformation history of a certain region, especially the more you have a region that suffered a long geologic history, it, uh, it's very likely it suffered many phases of deformation and you, you, you go into an orogenic belt and you, you find these zones that suffered uh, many phases of deformation. So a structural geologist will write a paper. And when you start reading the paper, I advise you to do it with a cup of coffee next to you after you wake up, not, not when you are very tired, because the paper will discuss things like this. Well, we have five or six phases of deformation. And the, the first phase of deformation, we had initially a foliation, the S0 foliation, and then we had the, uh, the S1 foliation, the L1 lineation associated with D1. And then when we had D4, this thing happened and the S1 foliation was transformed into something else. And you will kind of think, okay, <laughs> I have to, <laughs> I have to be very, very um, focused to follow this. Uh, I'm not giving you these things with S0, S1 lineation foliation just to, you know, uh, fill your head with, you know, nonsensical things. I want you to be prepared to be able to read the technical literature. Yeah, that's the idea. So that's why we discuss these things. And then you have to understand when they say intersection and for lineation, what they refer to. Okay, so you can have also intersection of two tectonic foliations. You can have a, 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 in a regions with a long history of deformation. You have one tectonic foliation like here, later one, another one and so on. And they are with different orientations. So where these planes intersect, you have lineations, yeah? Here is an example. You see intersection of bedding and cleavage. Yeah. So uh, basically, the bedding you can see the bedding here, uh, and you can see the cleavage like this. Yeah. So you can see the cleavage. So the intersection of cleavage and the bedding gives a lineation as well. I don't think this is a very good uh, photograph, but I think that it conveys the idea. So being a structural geologist is, in my opinion, quite demanding because you really, really have to always look at planes and construct in your mind a 3D image of what's happening. It's, a, it's a really demanding. Now, um, let's talk about uh, something called uh, granula granulation lineations. Basically, in some rocks, you have these very small folds being formed, yeah, at a very uh, short scale. And the uh, hinges, yeah, or the fold axis of the folds will create this lineation, yeah, they will create this lineation, and it's called granulation from the granulations, yeah. So basically, this would be the granulations. Yeah, and it's called granulation lineation, uh, especially in phyllosilicate rich metamorphic rocks, yeah, where you have these small folds or granulations. Uh, I don't want to insist too much on this. There are books written on the only on this topic. 
um, but just for you to know the term, it refers to this, this scale, you see, these are centimeters. So we talk about centimeter scale folds in some rocks and their hinges yeah, form this lineation in the rock. All right, and uh, finally, finally, boudinage. Now, we, you've seen boudinage, we talked when we talked about competent rocks, the, what, what it means in, uh, and so on. So basically this is, imagine a more competent layer. Yeah. So when it's stretched, basically it breaks into segments. Yeah. So these are the boudins. So imagine, imagine you had um, a layer, yeah, which is continuous, but as it was squished and deformed laterally, yeah, it was stretched to the point that there is separation yeah, between these boudins. Yeah, you see it here. And of course, you have these elements, elongated elements in the rock, and they can impart a certain type of lineation. Yeah, they are, uh, that's the idea. So you can see in, uh, in a situation where you have these folds here, yeah, you can see what happened with the continuity of this competent layer here. Yeah, this is a boudinage link. And you see the uh, strain ellipsoid, obviously. Yeah, so that's the other, the other aspect to be mentioned here. So I think this is it. Um, I want you to do some reading uh, so that you understand the concepts. Now, I want to stress, when you read in these sections, I want you to assimilate what we discussed in the class, yeah? If it's something new or you see formulas, mathematical formulas, so on, and that, that's optional, yeah? I don't expect you to, to know uh, what I did not discuss, uh, but it's difficult for me to say, okay, from that page, read the first paragraph and the third paragraph. I mean, I cannot do that. So I say, look, read these sections, but for instance, in 11.3, read only what relates to the concepts discussed in the presentation. It's more there, yeah, for instance. Uh, so that's uh, one thing I wanted to make it clear. All right, so this is it. Uh, if you have questions, you are more than welcome. If not, Feliz fin de semana. And I am waiting for those of you who have questions to contact me. I want you to be prepared for, for, uh, for test number three. It's not going to be different from test one or two or whatever. Only the material is different. Yeah, we discussed uh, different things. Uh, and uh, I want you to do well in this test. That's the idea. And to improve your situation. I want you all to improve your situation. All right, so this is it. I'll see you on Tuesday, a short class discussing shear zones. Uh, have a, a good weekend. Feliz fin de semana todos. Gracias. Hello, teacher.